All right, well, I wanted to get into book one today of Mills on the Subjection of Women. Um, and I wanted to start by talking about a chapter in Susan Oaken's book, Women in Western Critical Thought, because Oaken is a feminist scholar who is fairly representative of the reaction. It's sort of um, a, a middle of the road reaction, I guess, to John Stuart Mill's ideas here. So she was after him, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, I mean, she's a, well, this was written in the 80s, I want to say. So oh, oh, okay. Contemporary okay. person. Yeah, I've just never heard of her, so. Yeah, but well, yeah, she's a, a feminist scholar, but probably not one of, I wouldn't rank her as a famous contemporary political philosopher in her okay. own right. But this book, Women in Western Political Thought, is a pretty standard textbook for, you know, issues of women in, in political thought. And she does survey and kind of digest uh, the reactions to these different thinkers. And the first thing that she points out is that uh, liberalism, while it emphasized individual, individualism and equality, did not include women, and we've noticed that before, that most liberal thinkers just didn't include women, at least not fully. And you know, the fact that Hobbes and Locke deal with them at all is kind of actually surprising. <laughs> and they do so only in a part of their theory, but they don't extend it, right? So they deal with women in the state of nature and that sort of natural equality, but then they're pretty Ready, readily accepting of the inequality that happens in civil society, and they don't make that part of their agenda to, to address that. Um, and she points out this is, what, this is because, and I think I mentioned this last time, the general thought was that liberalism would be applied to male-headed families, so that the citizen, full-blown citizen, was the male head of household, and he represented the family, so the father, the husband, um, in some cases the brother, um, whoever was at the head of household, um, and that he would be able to represent the family's interests um, naturally as their leader. Okay. So I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. kind of make sure we're on the same page. She is observing this over time, correct? It's right. not one specific. Not just in his time, that. but prior to his time Sorry, as well. Okay. Pretty much all, all the time prior to the 19th century okay. as well. Okay. This was the way the family was viewed, even before liberalism in other systems. You know, the male head of household was the representative of the family. Um, within liberalism then, it wasn't the case that liberal ideas were necessarily applied to women or young people. Um, but rather still aristocratic ideas were more or less applied to them. So within the household it was still kind of a kingship, but it was supposed to be a benevolent monarchy. That was the ideal um, that the father uh, cared or the husband cared enough about the family to be thinking about all of their interests and to not be abusive and so forth. But of course, as Oaken points out, that ideal um, a lot of times wasn't the reality and the ideal doesn't give any sort of guarantee to women or young people uh, for their safety and their well-being and so forth. So um, and she points out John Stuart Mill tried to correct this in his own way by taking his utilitarian liberalism and applying it to women. Um, and as a utilitarian, Mill's project, as he saw it, was not to argue for absolute rights for women, but to argue that um, women's subjection actually hurt men and hurt society. So there's going to be a lot of arguments in here that are really aimed at men to try to convince men that it's in their self-interest. Um, so he argues in this chapter, or in this book, that women's subjection hindered improvements in society at all levels, on the intellectual level, slash professional level, the social level, and even the moral level. Some of this stuff is really interesting, some of his observations about morality um, and women are interesting because 
in the past, especially uh, prior to the development of liberalism, women were kind of in philosophy and theology held up on a little bit of a pedestal as the paragons of morality, sort of the, the keepers of the moral rules. And Mill argues contrary to that, that in their subjected state, they actually kind of bring uh, society down a little bit in that regard because they don't have the, uh, the strength or the, uh, the intellectual capacity at the moment to really understand morality all that well. Well, but in contrast to that, we also talked about like, how women had to resort to like mischief and manipulation and a mm -hmm. lot of other like, evil things because that was the only way they could succeed. Right, right. That, and he will make quite a bit of that and point out to men that this is not what you want. This is not the way that you want women to participate in the social and political world is through this subterranean manipulation because that's harmful. It ends up not being in anybody's interest. So on page two, I've got listed there some of the benefits that Mill that, and Oaken is pointing, this is all from Oaken, benefits for society that, that Mill is going to write about in this book. First of all, women are 50%, roughly, of the population, and so Mill says we, as 50% of the population, it is a value in and of itself that their lives would be improved. So he does address that, even though most of his arguments, for practical reasons, are not aimed at them, okay? Secondly, he argues that now, we don't know for sure exactly how much women are going to be contributing to the overall intellectual development of society. We are depriving ourselves of half of the potential capacity of, of mental faculties, okay? So with freeing this up, we would gain, we would inevitably gain, and who knows how much we would gain. So, one of the interesting aspects of his argument that some, and Oaken points out, some people object to the fact that Mill did not say we would absolutely be doubling this, but we, we haven't give women, given women the chance to show what they can do, and it's going to take time to see how much they can contribute. But he argues there's no benefit in holding them back. There okay. are women scientists at the time, though. There were a few, yes. Wasn't Madam, was Madam Curie? That's what I was yeah. going to say, yeah. And like Newton had some contemporaries who were women, right? Like um, Wollstonecraft. You know. Yeah, there were feminists at this time, and he was married to one. Right, so weird that he would say. But know, but but he would say, I think he does say in here that just because a few people excel right. doesn't mean the whole group is going to excel at the same rate, you know. And so you know he wouldn't deny that there are examples of women who have done things just as, um, has, have accomplished as much as men, but that the, on the whole, this group of people hasn't been allowed to show what it can do, okay? And whether it would be equal to, lesser, or greater than, the whole of the male population is yet to be seen, okay? Did we, uh, I was just curious, I can remember in GAS 300, did, um, did Reagan? Uh, okay, point number four. Um, and this was getting at what Becca had mentioned, equality, um, one of the benefits for society would be that equality would stop women's illegitimate dom dominance, which Mill makes much of. And basically, you know, from Oaken's point of view, plays into the stereotype of women's manipulation. But then maybe there, I mean, most stereotypes are based on some aspect of reality. They just get sort of blown out of proportion. Um, and Mill living at that time no doubt had a chance to witness some of this and um, he does treat it in a very sympathetic way. In other words, he says, you know, to the extent that women engage in this, it's because they have no other choice because we've basically placed them in a position where this is the only avenue that they have to any sort of influence whatsoever. I was going to say, because it kind of seems like a very bold statement to say that, you know, that all of them are in, like they influence their uneducated views, but he does it mm -hmm. more in a sympathetic way. Sort of he through. does, yeah. yeah, he does. And I don't believe he says all, but he does treat it like it's a fairly frequent phenomenon. 
you know. Well, he takes the position, like, sympathetic to the man in the relationship that doesn't, you know, he's like, I don't want to be a tyrant to you, but the woman's like, I don't want to be with you, so I'm mm -hmm. still going to, like, take advantage of you. I mean, it's still abuse. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and this is a belief about women that most male readers would have definitely held, mm -hmm. right? And so he's, one of his strategies is to, to accept the, if whatever you want to call it, stereotype or prejudice, accept it rather than argue with it, but then say, but let's take a close look at this mm -hmm. and see what is it caused by and can it be changed and that kind of thing. Which you have to admit would, would get men to listen more than if you said, hey, you're stupid for thinking this. <laughs> it's not going to work too well. Um, okay, so he will deal with that. He argues that justice should be applied to all if it's to mean anything. Otherwise, it's a sort of hypocrisy to say that you know all should be equal before the law, but to leave out 50% uh, of, of people that you recognize as human beings. Um, and um, argues that oppression, meaning in, you know unequal application of justice to anybody corrupts society's moral fiber, so it, it causes harm to men because they become used to being unjust, basically, through dealing with these people very differently. And another interesting argument that he makes that is taken up by feminists later on, including contemporary feminists, is this issue of exaggeration of gender and whether there is such a thing. Um, now, Mill thought there was that men and women both um, exaggerated their gender. In other words, women tried to be hyper-feminine and men tried to be hyper-masculine in order to be attractive and in order to have power in society. But that, and this is caused by, on the part of women, it's caused by, again, the fact that they don't have any other source of power. So they um, overdo you know, the, the feminine aspect, um, and they put on uh, a lot of uh, what I call armor, you know. Um, I'm watching a show right now, I don't know if anybody's seen this, but it's How to Get Away with Murder, okay? Mm -hmm. and, okay, in this Viola, Viola, what's her name? The teacher. Yeah, the teacher. She looks pretty good when she's got all of her gear on. Okay, she looks fantastic actually. She wears great outfits, she's got you know great makeup and hair. And then what they do is they show how, oh, you know, I think three episodes in, she takes it all off. She takes off her eyelashes, she's got her wig, so she pulls the wig off, she takes off all the makeup, and she mm -hmm. looks about 20 years older and like a completely different person. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think, you know, who is this person that is so covered up that you can't even recognize her, right? It's all armor. Um, people have criticized the show for, basically they took the message wrong. They said the reason why they have her wear the wigs and everything and look like this is because a black woman's beauty is not accepted in society. And so she has to look more like a white person. But the message of the show, I mean, I've seen, I have ran through the whole first season is, She's hiding herself, you know. I mean, it's all just a front uh, for another person who you get to see, you know, when she's not out there in court and, and all of this stuff. So it's a pretty good representation of, of what he's talking about here. You know, it's so extreme that you, that the, it's a costume. And I think that's the way he saw a lot of the upper class women of his day. They got the wig on, they got the, you know, heavy makeup, the, you know, the, the corsets, the, you know, they look like, you know, so when all this is taken off, which probably took about an hour, if not more, and probably that long to put on, then they became a completely different person. This is a sort of um, misuse of their time, and it doesn't, it means that in order to, to go out into society, they have to be something other than themselves if that makes sense. So men then can't know who they really are. They look at them like, wow, but they don't, <laughs> they have no idea what they're really getting. Well, Does it's that like make sense? walking around campus and the chicks that you can tell have like three layers of caked on makeup. 
just walking around yeah. doing nothing yeah. basically. Like, Which most t-shirt. Yeah. Like it's you know it's it's just the face and like I heard scrolling like mm. yeah my boyfriend doesn't even know what I really look like because I never take my makeup off. See there you go. And I couldn't even like oh process that. I was like how. Wow, it shouldn't be see. Shouldn't he know? Yeah, you that's, know. Yeah, <laughs> the, the whole up. makeup like thing. Like that we live in a society like <laughs> crazy. Well, well I mean, like at some point, like if you wear that much, like just being a female, you would know, and you'd probably know. Wearing that much makeup all the time would totally screw well, over your face. Right. So yeah. eventually, you have to keep on taking on more and more and more, and uh -huh. keep on changing the way that you naturally look, just because it keeps getting worse and worse. Oh yeah, it can become uh, like you're putting on war paint, basically. I mean, there's yeah. a, yeah. Especially young ladies should not have to I wear mean, hardly Queen any. Queen Elizabeth, didn't she like put on like, didn't she wear makeup for like two months at a time? Wasn't that right? And it like built up on her oh, face. Really? Yeah, that's that what I heard. The, oh my god. Was one of the that was like the ones. lead paint, the lead yeah. based stuff too, wasn't it? So yeah, it was that really white powder? She would build it's up the, this huge layer on her face. It's more like the, yeah. like a, like a, I think it's more like a, uh, have you guys, used the, like the more liquidy gel eyeliner or the, not eyeliner sorry uh, eyeshadow mm -hmm. it's i think it's that kind of consistency so it's, it's more like, like a paste kind of thing. Yeah, yeah and she would just Ooh, slap smack it on, on. Ooh. <laughs> and it would literally build up this huge wall on her face and she just have to like chop it off I'm surprised you guys didn't know that. Yeah, she would like wear it for like two months at a time. I learned no. that in high school, I think. I do yeah. remember wow. hearing that. And that's how that's how yeah. she eventually died, wasn't it? Just yeah. from the poisoning. Lead poisoning. Yeah, yeah, she got lead poisoning, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That's sad. I can't remember which Elizabeth it was. Oh, it was probably the first. first. It was probably the first, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, you know, I mean, that the white too. face was the thing. Back in the day, like, I don't know when the switch Yes, happened, they did. They, they powdered, like, they powdered their face in hair to be a yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah, they did. You're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. Um but um you know, I guess I guess Mill is saying both from the point of view of of the woman, she she can't be herself, right? She has to put on this great front. And from the point of view of the man, he doesn't know who he's looking at. So what is, you know, what is the benefit of this? I wonder what he would have thought of like during the Sun King's reign, when both men and women did all the fancy dressing up uh -huh. over in France, uh -huh. and like Louis the Fourteenth, everybody, right? yeah, wore makeup and the wigs and everything. Well, I don't think he liked that much either. Um, but in his day, I think he sees women engaging in more of this than men. Though you're you're right. I mean, men's upper class men's fashion was pretty, pretty elaborate as well. But women would get them, and I think he mentions corsets at some point. Women yes. would get themselves into these ridiculous, you know, their waists would be this, this big. Whenever I think about that, I always think of Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. The first one the Caribbean. Yeah. 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 Well, they had to invent furniture to accommodate it. Like, what is it, um, settees, I think? Settees. So that they would be able to faint all the way up. They could just mm -hmm. kind of recline. Because they would catch them when they faint. Oh, they God. <laughs> Well, it would be excruciating on your organs, you know? I mean, it just, you can't fit. There's a circus lady nowadays that I think her, I don't remember how much, how big her waist is. I think it's like somewhere about that big around oh because God. she's worn corsets basically since she was 12 years old. And like, they're That's not, not just, right. you know, the, the ones nowadays that they put in prom dresses. They're the metal corsets That's that scary. are completely metal and it's just, that is really scary. And it's really gross. So and her organs, to they've moved up and, up and down. Yeah, right. And That's so, like, if she ever actually takes them out, she'll have a huge, like, shift yeah. around her body and she'd die. She so has she to can't. keep on wearing corsets for the rest of her life, basically. Ooh. And she's, like, in her 50s, 60s. Yeah. Wow. So it's wow. like... I can't imagine that she even want to live that much longer when you're like that at that point. That's... No. It's so... That's got to look just bizarre. She's in the Guinness World Book of Records, I yeah. believe, right now, yeah. <laughs> for having the smallest waist. Well, you go to museums where you see some of these women's fashions, and they're not that extreme, but they're still just, you know, you could put your, your hands around their waist entirely, mm -hmm. and that's just not natural, you know. Yeah. So they were forcing themselves into things that just couldn't possibly be comfortable. Imagine going around all day 
with in pain basically you know um, and feeling like that's what it takes to be acceptable in society so it's interesting that Mill dwells on this um, and I think unusual to dwell on the makeup and fashion side of the situation you know for a man to to think about that you know probably Harriet's influence there and what she had to say about that and her own personal experience and so forth. Okay, so these are some of the points that he's going to make. Now, Oaken um, goes into criticism, and sorry for doing this up front, but it, just to kind of make you aware of some of the criticisms of feminists uh, about Mill, which are kind of a little unfair. I mean, we'll grant you that it's because her criticizing him it's her crack. criticizing him, but you know, in the midst of she's she's bearing this criticism through discussing other feminist thinkers too. Okay, so it's not just her. I mean, they give him credit for being kind of at the forefront at his time, but yet not going far enough. And it is it is a little unfair because he was perhaps not able to imagine much more than, than he did, not being able to, I mean, if he could see today what, how we are, he might be quite happy, but he couldn't possibly have maybe imagined that. Well, do you think he was just going just far enough in his time for people to think about accepting it? Because yeah. I, I don't think he wanted to present himself like as being Right, radical, radical and crazy. Yeah, yeah right. I, because I, I, I mean, so. he knows that from his upbringing that you don't want to be. You don't want to just push all yeah. of it right to the yeah. forefront. You have to take small incremental steps. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I definitely think so because he really wants to be heard. He really wants to be persuasive. And if he's, if he did go too far, they would just not read him. Right. I think you're right. Um, but here's some of the criticisms. First of all, Mill does uphold the family and traditional marriage okay so he is not going to tackle you know traditional marriage marriage for life or even generally male leadership in marriage okay um, nor is he going to tackle the traditional roles as much as modern feminists would like okay so he will argue for generally a traditional division of labor still he considers it fairly natural for women to care for children and stay at home and for men to go outside the family and work, although he does allow for some women who really do not want to do that to work, okay? But if they do that, then they shouldn't get married, okay? So this is a major problem for feminists. He does say that women are naturally not only the child bearers, but the child rearers, and Oaken says this inevitably produces inequality, as long as you say that, that women are the natural child rears and for the most part their role should be to raise children. And if they want to do something else after that is done, then more power to them, but that's their chief role. She says that because they have then put all of their energies into child rearing for all those years, then they can't possibly mat catch up with with men. Okay, does that make sense? I don't think I would agree with that because like okay, so for the rich people I mean for like the poor people maybe, but like mm -hmm. rich people had nannies and mm -hmm. governesses mm -hmm. and private schools. Right. And pretty much every way to get rid of their kids, which <laughs> they did and so they yes, they did. And yeah. He wouldn't have argued for doing that, though, and that being a way to properly raise a kid, would he? No. Okay. No, he seems to value parental involvement in okay. children's lives. So, but he does say, you know, if a woman really wants to work outside the home and find some provision for taking care of her children, then she can do that. But. I do, I agree. I mean, based on everything he says in this book, he seems to value women actually being there for their children. But that's He never had any kids, right. correct? Yeah, right. So I, I wonder if that so has a lot to do with, like, 
well, I, I think his mom was taking care of the children and not, you know, but I don't know for sure. I wonder if that's yeah, why. You're thinking she was ignoring this terrible situation with Bentham, right? <laughs> I, I kind of wonder yeah. if that's why he argues that women are the natural child rearers because he was kind of raised by his father and mm -hmm. yeah. Bentham. And, and he, he wishes that he, he was wishes raised he was by his mom. He sees how it went, yeah. His mother was not like Harriet. She wasn't a scholar or anything like that. Now, what most likely she stayed at home and let, but let servants help run the household, and may, you know, maybe either wasn't involved or, I mean, obviously she looked the other way or didn't have any problem with what her husband wanted to do. Um, Mill does make a big deal over, you know, women need to be 50% of the decisions about the education and upbringing of children, whereas men have all that decision now. So maybe that's partly based on his experience. So um, now other, there are some feminists who argue that women should, and that, uh, that there is a difference between men and women. There are so-called difference feminists who say there is a difference between men and women. Women bear children and they are more maternal and nurturing and it is a legitimate choice for them to stay home and raise their children and it should be equally valued. And even some of them argue it should be compensated. Um, Mill argues that it should be equally va valued. This is, he would agree more with them and saying that you know the problem here is that we've downgraded the role of rearing children whereas it's very very important it should be done by them and it should be done well and you can't do that well and hold a job at the same time so we if we ask women to do that and hold a job at the same time he actually says that's abusive <laughs> what would he advocate then for like single mothers single mothers have to work I mean, I don't, th I think that Mill does not tackle single motherhood in this book, okay? So I can't tell you for sure, but I think he would consider single motherhood a form of abuse as well. Because, you know, when a father fathers a child, he ought to take responsibility for that child and not force a woman to both work and rear the child at the same time. I mean, I can extrapolate that from what he says, but he does not deal with single motherhood. Okay. It just was. I mean, it's an issue now that's a huge issue. Back then, single mothers generally, to the extent that they existed, got taken in by their families. You know? Because it was that probably a big taboo back then. It was a huge taboo, yeah. right? So the children were not accepted as legitimate members of the family. They were bastards. Women tried to find a way to get rid of pregnancies for this reason, if they got pregnant out of wedlock. Say you look at Game of Thrones with Jon Snow, mm -hmm. it's a good example. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, a, it was a matter of shame. A man wouldn't marry a woman just because he got her pregnant out of wedlock, mm -hmm. you know, and so this would be the end of her future, basically. Um, it seems like a really big double standard that he doesn't tackle in this. Yeah. For mm -hmm. being such a big thing, because it, mm -hmm. I mean, if a woman did get pregnant out of wedlock, like you said, her entire, basically, life was almost ruined. Mm -hmm. Like, she was shamed, she was shunned. I mean, but the man could just go around and be like, oh, no, I'm fine, I'm good. Right, right. Yeah, I'm surprised yeah, she doesn't address that in this book. Not that I recall. I mean, mm -hmm. as we go through it, maybe we'll find it, but I don't remember him dealing with that. And maybe, again, it's not a visible thing in his society. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a major thing like it is for us today, where, I mean, literally something like 50% of children are born out of wedlock now, and it's not. But we do still have the problem of, you know, single mothers have to both rear their children and work full time and I do think Mill would say that is wrong. No, nobody should have to try to do both of those things at the same time. Well, look at the, all the orphanages that they had as much yeah. and so it's like, oh, I have a baby. Well, I can either, like, my life can be over essentially and I'll be shamed by society yeah. or I can drop the kid off at a right. factory. They would go off on, you know, the ones that could afford it would go off to some other country to have to, you know, have their pregnancy and baby 
drop it off in an orphanage and come back and just call them an extended, you know, extended vacation so that they could come back and still be considered eligible for marriage. So, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that happened. Wow. Yeah, so it was very undercover. Mm -hmm. And if it was found out that you had, well, virginity was highly prized. So if it was found out that you had had sexual relations outside of marriage, you were also going to be ineligible for mm -hmm. marriage. You know, so a lot of men at this time thought, well, it's kind of all on the woman to make sure she's chaste and, you know, keeping that uh, safe for marriage. And if she got pregnant, it was more or less her fault. So she needed to take care of it. That really bugs me about that time. Because it's like, <laughs> the man time. can go off, well, eh. <laughs> but, like, a man could go off and, you know, knock up ten women and he would not get any kind of reprimanding or right. anything and he'd be totally fine but those 10 women he's basically ruined ruined yeah right so when the kids you know will never know their father if they did he would deny them all. he would either deny them completely or certainly not you know take care of them yeah. in any way he'd be ashamed of them so yeah it was a huge double standard and uh no getting around it i think that mill is you know tackling what he thinks he can tackle, and that might not be one of those things, uh, but it's certainly wrong. And even now, I mean, you have to say, even though we have child support laws, um, they don't pay for most of a child's upkeep. What what most guys are able or willing to pay in child support, it's still the case that women bear the brunt of pregnancy out of wedlock. They still have to pay for most of it, and they do most of the work. And dad, if he's even in the picture, comes and visits every once in a while. But a lot of men just leave. You know, they're, they're in another state somewhere, or they disappear. So I would say we fixed that issue, and it's, it's a huge issue. Um, okay, so there's disagreement about whether um, staying at home inevitably produces inequality. Oaken argues that it does. That in fact, in order for there to be male-female equality, you have to have men involved equally with women in raising children. Okay, so in her vision, equality would come from men and women both working and sharing child rearing. Mm -hmm. That way, they're both making money and they're both parenting. Okay, other other people do say no. Um, the problem is male attitudes towards motherhood. It's a valuable thing keeping taking care of children and keeping a household. And some of them say, we need to pay, society somehow needs to come up with a mechanism for paying women for this because if we don't, then they don't have their own financial independence and they won't be as respected. So this is the way we get equality. How does she address the, like, the both parents working? Because like, when I was growing up, both my parents worked and as lawyers, so like long hours, and mm -hmm. like my grandma basically, you know, part raised me. Mm -hmm. So it's just like there's a point at which you just can't do both. Right, like, right. Because there aren't enough hours in the day. I think that she does, well, she would say, you know, both parents need to commit to truly sharing the responsibility. So there's, there's ways that you can do that, but it takes effort, in other words, to be able to work out you know, how you're actually going to be involved. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> I was raised kind of like that too, except for my dad did, he was a teacher, so he was able to get home in, um, in somewhat like late afternoon. But yeah, my mom was gone a lot. Um, and, you know, at a certain point, how much parenting can occur, right? So, yeah, it's, it's a balancing act, and of course the criticism of that feminist line is that's a balancing act that's, that sounds good in theory, but in practice it's difficult, especially for professionals, because with professionals they can't always ratchet back. If they ratchet back, they may lose their, either their livelihood or at least their potential future earnings. Okay, so like if your mom had decided to be a half-time lawyer, um, which she could have done, but it might have cost her, over the course of her career, 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. I, I mean, I don't know how much she makes, but <laughs> in, in my case, um, of course, I have the, the luxury of being able to fix my own hours, which really helped, but I could not choose to stay home with, with my son. If I had chose to stay home with my son, I would have had to forfeit being a professor entirely. You cannot take mm -hmm. off a year or two. <laughs> you can't. You just can't. And nor can you like leave one job and find another one. Your career is over. So um, the most that you can do is, is basically take a semester or a year off in infancy while you're still trying as best you can to publish something. I waited until I got tenure to have a child because I couldn't possibly have done it otherwise. Um, so these are the kind of uh, issues that go on in women's heads when they're working, especially at a professional job, unlike a blue collar job where you can get another one. You know, you can quit and like my mother, you know, could have quit. She was a secretary. She could have quit and gone back and found another secretarial job a few years later. She didn't want to because it was the 70s and every woman was trying to get a job, <laughs> 70s and 80s. So um, anyway, there's a lot of issues surrounding that. He gets to some of it. Um, and his answers are not satisfactory to a lot of feminists. Um, also, criticism of Mill is that he doesn't see how equality in marriage necessitates women earning wages. So he's, and I've already kind of touched on this, but he says that uh, unpaid labor in the household is equal, but, but feminists say men respect money making. Okay. Now, the issue I have with that is, do we really need to accept men's standards you know, for what makes us valuable? Because that, that's a concession that I think goes a bit too far to say, men won't respect us until we're making money. It just seems... Yeah. wrong. So I, I think I like Mill's position. I just think that, I mean, I, and I think Mill recognizes that over, it takes time to change people's minds and attitudes about mm -hmm. this. Um, also, Mill doesn't argue that domestic duties need to be shared, so we've already talked about that. All right. So we have a few minutes left. Let's get into um, chapter one. All right, so he recognizes that the biggest obstacle to women's equality is that custom has, it, it for, for hundreds of years, basically has kept women in this subservient position, and that custom and feeling are very formidable obstacles, and that both men and women often accept these customary ideas without question. They're brought up that way, all of society tends to uh, validate it. Women's behavior validates it. So it's very difficult. He's, he's got a really um, big task ahead of him. He says it should be enough to prove females should be equal, to ask where's your proof that they are not, that they are naturally unequal. Um, but he can't stop at that. Okay? He says on page two, 652 on the right, in the first full paragraph, he says, in all other cases, the burden of proof, burden is an old-fashioned spelling, the burden of proof is supposed to lie with the affirmative. If a person is charged with murder, it rests with those who accuse him to give proof of his guilt, not with himself to prove his innocence. Okay, So he says, you know, if we were treating this like a regular um, case of justice, we would say, okay, men who think that women are unequal, give us your solid proof, okay? But we can't do that because we're fighting against such strong feelings and prejudices here. So he says, I'm going to have to disprove, and I'm going to try to disprove every single one of your misconceptions, okay? No matter how silly they are, and I do think he finds some of them silly, like when he talks about the cranial size of men and women. This was the some, some of the pseudoscience that was occurring at this time. As you know, men, male sci scientists were saying, you know, women's body and their brain size is smaller, so this is why um, they are not as um, intelligent as men. Okay, so Mill will have to prove that these customs have no basis in nature, and that women's subjection is wholly artificial, okay, or conventional. 
Okay? Um, he speculates about what started women's subordination to men, and he goes to a place where a lot of people go, a fairly common sense place with men's superior physical strength. Okay? So he imagines that women's subjection began because men were stronger than women and men valued women for you know, their sexual needs and also for needing or wanting to have children. And so they basically just were able to um, overpower them or bully them. He likens this to slavery um, and how slavery would have gotten started. I just think this is kind of a neat, it says a lot about his views about slavery and the slave trade too. On 656 on the right, towards the top, he says, less than 40 years ago, England, Englishmen might still by law hold human beings in bondage as saleable property. Within the present century, they might kidnap them and carry them off and work them literally to death. This absolutely extreme case of the law of force condemned by those who can tolerate almost every form of arbitrary power in which all of all others presents features the most revolting to the feelings of all who look at it from an impartial position, was the law of civilized and Christian England within the memory of persons now living. And in one half of Anglo-Saxon America, three of four years ago, or four years ago, not only did slavery exist, but the slave trade and the breeding of slaves expressly for it was a general practice between slave states. So you could literally just physically carry people off. Didn't he work for the East India West India? He did, he did. And basically, I mean, the, and it was involved in the slave trade. Obviously, he did not approve of slavery, but he worked for the company anyway, okay? It's sort of like, I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying that, that he did the right thing, but it's sort of like if you need a job that's really steady and you work for Philip Morris, but you think smoking kills people. Okay. So it's, you know, he, he went for the steadiest, most secure and, you know, position he could. And um, to give him some credit, he never was in a position to advocate the slave trade in the company. He was a secretary, he wrote letters, memos that were basically ordered by other people. So he wasn't a policy maker, but he is criticized for that. You know, how could you make your living in a company that part of its profits come from something that you so disapprove of? You know, could he have gotten another job? Probably, you know. I really feel like Mill jumped into this, you know, very secure, it basically was a lifetime job, you know. Um, to get away from his family, and he didn't mind working these grunt level <laughs> positions just to be able to have that security. So, okay, so when we come back, we'll leap into the books more. Yeah, you'll have to let me know when Reagan talks about.